we have on this webinar Ruby Payne, and I'm interviewing yes. uh, Gary Eagleton and Angelina Hudson, both of who have incredible uh, histories, work histories with the whole issue of mental health, and we're talking about mental health and COVID. So, Gary, why don't you say in a sentence, a couple minutes, what your background is and what you've done with um, mental health? Okay, I uh, first of all, I'm retired military, uh, wounded in Vietnam. Um, in addition to that itself, then a um, post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis as well. What um, what I did primarily with all of that stuff uh, as a younger person was all destructive. Um, about ten years ago, uh, I met Angelina, and through Angelina, I was introduced to NAMI, and I found that NAMI tools were very, very, very important in developing uh, some platforms and some foundations for people to do some work differently, and also found out real quickly that those tools were not really available in the underserved and under-resourced communities. So, so together, one of the things that we did was we set out to get those tools into those communities and in doing so uh, I've become a state trainer with the with the National Alliance on Mental Illness and um, uh, I've also introduced uh, some of that material into the 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 state of Texas Department of State Health Services community health worker um, uh, uh, trainings so that has kind of been my entrance into the mental health community. And since then, I found out that generationally, uh, uh, we've been there, but we just were not acknowledged as being there. And then also within my family present generations, there's, there's a couple of, of diagnoses. So, so it's kind of become more real than just picking up a book and reading, but but knowing at first hand some of the things that are really creating more problems and are more problematic for individuals uh, with mental health, mental illness issues. Angelina, would you say a little bit about your background? About my background, well, um, I work in the mental health community now as the director of education with the Greater Houston Affiliate for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But I didn't start off as a staff or as an employee. I started off as a mom who was trying to figure out what is going on with my child's development. And so uh, it was actually 18 years ago that I took my first class to learn what's happening here because I could not parent my child the way I was parented. It was, I was unsuccessful. And there were a lot of strange behaviors and I was not getting a lot of solid answers from the medical community because when there's a behavioral health condition, especially when it involves a child, there, they, there's a tendency to try to see if the child is gonna grow and develop out of, of certain presenting symptoms and issues. And, and boy, it, there was not enough growth or development moving fast enough for me. And so I sit, I sat in this class with 22 other parents and eventually learned, and it did take some years. I wanna say I, I started the class when he was four, but it was not until my son was seven that he was diagnosed with autism. And then from that, or during the, that journey, I learned that my oldest child was diagnosed with um, anxiety-related disorders, ADHD, the inattentive type. And then I have this third one we call the Yahoo. Uh, boy, that, that's, been, that's been something else, raising him. And so uh, at the end of the day, I now have three adults who have all matriculated successfully through, uh, you know, K through 12. But it took a lot of support and a lot of education and a lot of... Um, you know, just stick, what do you call it? Stick to itiveness, you know, staying, um, uh, you know, in those conversations to make sure that I understood how best to support this family of mine. And, and, and so now much. I get the pleasure of sharing that with others. And we're glad you're sharing it with uh, our audience. 
And mm -hmm. so my first question is that we're looking at mental health and COVID. And COVID mm -hmm. has really ex accelerated things. What is it that about, and either of you, however you want to answer, what is it about mental illness that makes many days seem like a crisis? I'll be real brief with, as a, as a man of few words, but I think that people suffering with, uh, at, from mental illness not only deal with the same challenges um, that other under-resourced communities and, and, and people do, um, and you can, you can, because I'm very, very familiar with the poverty work. When I look at how poverty is defined as, as, as missing resources, that's the same thing that we look at when we look at um, eight dimensions of wellness. We talk about employment, we talk about relationship issues, we talk about separation and divorce, child care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's also then on top of that, the very ugly face of stigma associated with mental illness. In many of our cultures and our communities, it's not acceptable. It's not okay to mention or to admit that there is a mental health disorder in our family, uh, clinical depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. And you could go on to all of them, but when someone is living with a mental illness as either one of those, they also experience, and we never think about it, fatigue. And in, and, and in being fatigued, they find it very difficult, or we find it very difficult to manage basic self-care and day-to-day -day activities. Some have difficulties with, and Anthony can probably talk a whole lot more than self-regulating. But when I think of that whole self-regulating piece, what I think of, again, going back to your work, is tyranny of the moment. All of a sudden, I find myself here, and I don't have any of the resources to take care of myself. What do I do? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of how I see that crisis. That crisis is here. I'm not prepared for it. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Angelina. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter the diagnosis. Um, it, it's really the, one of the consistent elements of all mental health conditions, whether it's mild and there's no diagnosis or if it's moderate or severe, there's gonna be some degree of self-regulation problem. You know, um, whether it's triggered by other people or just sensory integration issues or just watching the news or what's going on in the public, things that are beyond our control, any of these things can be a trigger for us. And if and if we're not aware, or even if we are aware of our triggers, the idea of not being able to self-regulate, self-soothe, to calm oneself down without some sort of coping skill that may or may not be positive, such as, you know, um, some negative coping skills uh, could include like uh, drinking or uh, cutting or staying in bed, you know, for hours and hours and hours, days, you know, sometimes weeks, um, or maybe uh, eating, anything we do to sort of help soothe our emotions. And, and what brings about the crisis, of course, is when those types of behavior kind of interfere with our ability to get along with other people, um, especially get along with like law enforcement. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if those things escalate, then, and, and what you're having now with COVID is that whatever people use to get by already, with the shelter in place and a lot of the businesses being closed and maybe that bartender that you talked to, you know, every night for three hours, that was just all that you needed. Or maybe it was the beauty shop or the barber shop where you hung out and those places are closed. Well, you don't have those those coping strategies and that's what can bring about, about a crisis. Um, and one of the things is what, COVID in many ways has exacerbated, as you said, your normal soothing mechanisms are not available, okay? Mm -hmm. And COVID has increased death and COVID has increased secondary trauma. And it's kind of a, an unseen enemy that you can't name and you can't get your fingers on and you can't, literally it's hard to stay safe. How does that impact 
how does that add layers to the whole mental uh, health issue? Gary, I'll jump in real quick here because the way I, I see that is you're looking at two different populations. You're looking at one group that was already identified. They were already, uh, you know, working out their recovery program. They they are on medication. They have a routine in place. They have a network of support. They have some coping skills, right? And they they know their diagnosis. They deal with anxiety or depression or you know some diagnosis, right? And with COVID and then the, the anxiety on the news, like you said, you can't touch it. You, the bottom line, you can't control it. You don't know when it's going to end. Even when they open up the city and you're back to work or whatever, you don't know if it's going to come back, if there's going to be a second or third phase, and if it's going to get you or someone you love and heaven help you if it's someone who financially supports you. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it brings about, it exacerbates that anxiety, the fear of the unknown. And coupled with the fact that your normal interventions, your coping skills, the people that, like you have someone that comes over and wakes you up every day so you can get to work on time. <laughs> or you have some place you can go to church and you can uh, use your, 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 your faith to kind of reset yourself for the new week. And you can't even go to church right now. So, you know, there's that group that were already struggling now in a worse scenario because they don't have those those coping strategies at hand. Then there's this other group, and that's what I'm watching. There's a group that have never been diagnosed. They never have, they don't have a mental illness. I'm not mentally ill. I'm not emotionally unwell. But this experience has really bubbled up some some symptoms or some characteristics that they cannot cope as well with they can't and they don't have a thing to call it so there's not like i'm not if i've never been diagnosed or even thought of myself as someone dealing with depression i'm not going to reach out for mental health support and so how do we help that group because they're not going to say oh i'm mentally ill help me no <laughs> i don't have mental illness you know and so uh and they may not but this is a traumatic experience for us all and so how do you get the help and support you need without having to label it or call it something, but at least get yourself stabilized again? And I think that's the work of many of our communities as well right now. And I think that that impact is, is, is pretty easily stated as any, just like it would be for anyone with a chronic illness. What? Sure do mm -hmm. i do where do i go how do i explain this i don't have a name for this and nobody accepts the name anyway when i say i'm this or i'm this <laughs> then we have this whole <laughs> list of things that we know it by anywhere from from how we refer to their buses to to you name it i think the problem is further exacerbated by you can't make any kind of human contact right or human contact is now dangerous so you don't know whether they have it or not COVID, and they don't know whether they have it or not they don't know right so you can't it's like being in being a stranger in a strange land and everybody's a stranger do you know what i mean you i think that's an old another level on top of it uh, right you go to the grocery yeah. store and you're afraid of the people that you're walking around yeah and and it's hard to you don't know what to trust you don't know what to have confidence in and so this is a very trying time and then our, our young people who may not even have the emotional vocabulary to express what they're feeling so i'm noticing a whole new generation like that are dealing with um the stress surrounding COVID, not being able to graduate and you're a senior you know, not being able to go on your class trip or uh, weddings that have been canceled. Uh, so right there, this big transition in life from childhood to adulthood to even more adulthood, you know, starting your life together with someone that you're planning to, to marry. All of that is kind of being interrupted. Even our funerals, the way we we honor people when they and, and grieve is interrupted. And uh, and so now we have to look for new interventions, new ways. There's telemedicine, telehealth. There's warm lines. There's now these other there's Zoom, uh, Skype kind of uh, 
systems to support people in different ways. And I think that now that all of these new ways to wrap our arms around each other are becoming available, Ruby, I think they're going to stay. And so for our listeners, one of the questions I'd have for both of you, if you have someone or you yourself are having a lot of stress and trauma and, you know, I like your distinction of groups who know what they have and groups who don't know what they have. And I think um, that's really true. And um, in uh, fact, a story I heard today was about a, um, a mother, a teacher, educator, who her son, eight or nine years old, is always terrified of storms, thunderstorms, lives in Houston. And last <laughs> night or the night before, there was a thunderstorm. And she said he stood at the window and was thrilled with the storm and was like, let's rain, let's go. And he was so happy with the hail. And she was just stunned. And then she realized, she said, you know what? This is something he can see, he can touch, he can, you know. Meanwhile, the other trauma that he's dealing with, who's safe and who's not and who's sick and who's not and all that, sure. he can't put his hands on that one. But this one he can. So right. what would, what advice would you give um, if somebody's there's someone in their home, they're worried about, they're worried about themselves. What are three or four things? Uh, uh, and I'd like to ask each of you this question. What are three or four things you would recommend they do? Because you mentioned tele. Uh, you've talked about NAMI, National Association of Mental um, or Mental Illness. Mm -hmm. Illness. So what would you recommend, two or three things each of you, what would you recommend to someone who's really struggling right now or has a, a, a family member? Well, I think at the very beginning, I mentioned I'm living with a large group of young people right now. And when I noticed uh, some telltale signs, some behaviors like staying in bed all day and all night, drinking maybe a little bit more wine than they should, you know, that kind of thing. Um, because, you know, I'm just, I, I feel like I'm just everybody's mama. I pulled everybody together and I said, you know, just this is a very different time. You've not seen anything like this in your lifetime before, okay? And and the future is kind of, uh, un, un, you don't know what to expect. Uh, so there's two or three things I, I need you to do for me. I didn't say for them, you know, because they think this is all a bunch of hogwash anyway, right? So I said, I need you to keep a routine. I don't care if you sleep all day and you're up all night or vice versa. You you were industrious all day and sleep, you know, but pick you a wake time and a sleep time. Pick you a bath time. Let's work out who's going to be in the kitchen at what time. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, just start getting yourself on some kind of routine. Believe it or not, it, it was it was good for us coming up and it's good for us as as young adults and as adults. So, um, and then I, I also recommend it, get some sunlight every day, get outside. If you can't run, then ride a bike. If you can't ride a bike, walk. If you can't walk, just sit in the chair and put it outside. Now that's what I do, I sit outside. But just do something outdoors and get into a routine. And the third thing is do not stop connecting. Now, of course, I can't get with the video games with the headsets and all that yelling at people in other houses through the but but they're still connecting, right? So as long as you stay because people are wired to connect the brain, that's how we were designed. We were we were made to connect with one another. And at least once a week we have dinner. I don't care if we don't all sit at the table, but we all sit in the same room. It's just it's just old fashioned, you know, let's stay let's stay interested in one another's welfare. But now, as you stated, it can get much more serious than that. Right. So one of the things about uh, this covid crisis, there's a lot of funding out there to try to reach help and find seek out those people who are not eating, who are isolating, who are just for, for lack of a better word, they're just losing it in this in this time of, of, of COVID-19 uh, threat and crisis. So uh, the best thing to do for a person, uh, or if, if it's not someone you know, but it's you, 
reach out. There are help lines, warm lines. Even our crisis lines can help you find what's called a warm line. That means a, a crisis line is for people who um, they're worried about their own welfare, their life, you know, or they're worried about, uh, you know, they feel a threat from somewhere else, right? So that would be a crisis. But the warm lines are just there to hear what you've got to say and help you troubleshoot, help you figure out how how to get out of the situation you're in. Um, all of your uh, states, all of your counties across the country have what's called local mental health authorities. You do not have to have a mental health diagnosis or condition, uh, especially right now with COVID, you could call any local mental health authority. In Houston, that's called the Harris Center, but they've got different names, but call your local mental health authority and ask for some assistance, a warm line, or just that you need someone to talk to. I know that there are doctors right now offering free uh, telehealth counseling sessions, you know. So in our warm line, NAMI has a warm line both nationally and many of the local affiliates have warm lines as well. And we collect information on who's doing what service, especially if you don't have insurance especially if you've never, you know how you have to go to your PCP and get a referral? Well, let's say you don't have that. So, you know, the warm lines are very, very, uh, they will help you puzzle piece your, your issues together. And it doesn't matter if they're uh, mental health, emotional health, behavioral health. It could be something tangible like rental assistance, uh, food support, delivery, whatever. I, I recommend, I highly recommend reaching out to either NAMI or local uh, helplines. Are those local helplines 211 or? Yes, now you can call 211 and they'll connect you to a warm line. Now 211 is not a warm line, 211 is a referral, right? But, um, and if you're looking for like a NAMI that has a warm line in your area, you can call the 1-800 NAMI helpline and they will send you to your local area. What I like about national helplines is that they do have a breakdown of what's available in your state, in your county, in your city, sometimes just your part of town or your community. And the, I think the last little recommendation I have is if you're a person and you know you already have some issue going on, let's say your issue is anxiety. They are nonprofit organizations just for anxiety or just for schizophrenia or just for bipolar disorder or just, and I could rattle them all off, but it's better if you're in your community to just Google and find one that's local, right? And within the context of that specific diagnosis, they can help you find doctors or therapists or clinicians or supports. Sometimes it's just a coach, a life coach that can support and walk the distance with you, very specific to your symptoms. But if you've never been in this arena before, I say call a helpline. And there's so many of those popping up right now. Thank you. And if you don't like one, call another one. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Angelina and has covered what would you say? it's whenever Angelina goes first there's usually nothing left there is one I'm tool so that sorry. that we that we discovered several years ago that we have used quite successfully in this area and that and it's, it's a national program but it's mental health first aid which is an eight-hour national certification program and basically what it does it provides it, it provides the same kind of thing for mental health that CPR has provided for physical health. And it gives a tool to folks that says, uh, you have now some tools to it, not, not that you're a social worker, not that you're a therapist, not that you're a counselor, but here is a first aid tool that will allow you to recognize when someone is in danger and what it is that you can do from a very, um, uh, for, from a place loaded with empathy that allows individuals to be okay with the fact that you have said that you can assist me move from where I am to a better place. And that tool.
has been great. We, and then I probably are within the top 10, top 20 uh, performers of mental health first aid in the country right now. You know what I thought you were going to bring up, Gary? I thought you were going to bring up community health workers because their knowledge base of what's available. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't know if, if Ruby, if you are familiar with community health workers, the state of Texas, I think right now has certified more community health workers than any other state. But basically what that does is it takes individuals and provides them with information and skills to deliver health services to under-resourced communities primarily. Um, and the state certifies them. So not only do they go through, I think it's a 16, um, 160 hour training, comes with the state certification and UT Physicians Association, which are now all over the place, probably are hiring more of those community health workers than any other single uh, company or organization. that I'm aware of, but it does provide people to be kind of on the front line dealing with folks that they know, that they know their background, that they know their lifestyle, that they've been there, and they can more easily connect and speak that language. How would, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but how would, if someone wanted to contact you, Angelina, or contact you, Gary, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, for me, it would be just to contact NAMI Grady Houston, and, and I, I was that. hoping you'd give us, yeah, I, I would, um, I, I work for NAMI Grady Houston, but we also have a warm line, and right now, we're really expanding that warm line to take an increased number of calls, and we're doing a lot of outreach into some of the communities that have been hit the hardest in the Houston area by this COVID virus, and there's been a lot of loss and devastation. Uh, behind that. So we've been reaching, we're, you know, we're launching this initiative to really find people, like I said, who are under the bed, really wondering what they're going to do and many times for the first time. But what I wanted to say, if I don't say anything else, what I, I want to convey is that when you're at home and you're struggling and you're struggling and you don't even really know why, but you feel like the pieces are not coming together for you and you can't seem to grapple with it on your own. Do know that people care. I think the biggest uh, hurdle to overcome is the feeling of that no one cares. There's no help for you. You don't have the money. You don't have the resources. You don't even have the wherewithal to get dressed. And sometimes you think that because of those reasons, there's no hope for you. That is so far from the truth, right? If if on one day, all you can do is get the number in front of you and just lay it on the table, if it takes you another three months to pick that number up, you know, reach out. That's, that's the thing, because there's been an increase in domestic violence uh, behind this uh, COVID experience. There's been, an, I think wine sales are up 66% across the nation. And that's just wine, you know? So, you know, so people are really uh, uh, pulling at straws to cope with this scenario best they can. Some of us are, are winning that struggle. Some of us are not winning. And for those who are not winning, I just really encourage you to, you know, call your local NAMI, call your local mental health authority, call a nonprofit, that, call your local church, but call someone and keep calling until you find that voice on the, the other end that really conveys that they understand you, they get you, and they're willing to walk the distance with you. We don't have to have all the answers right away. I think the first thing people need to know when they don't have uh, uh, the um, the wherewithal to use or to manage their resources like you talk about. Um, they just need to know that somebody cares and there's always somebody that does. Let me, and let me throw this Gary, in quick. Right there's another real, uh, The easiest way to contact me is through my email address. And uh, would you like to have that now? Yes, please. Okay, that would be Gary, G-A-R-Y dot eagleton e a g l e t o n at s w 
bell.net. Yes, that's Southwestern Bell. Uh, dot net. <laughs> now, one of the things that I would really like to mention, as a, which is really, really powerful, is that with NAMI, Angelina and I have the 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 um, the opportunity to replicate ourselves. We provide the training for NAMI tools throughout this throughout this area. And all of the people that are being trained to provide support groups, and we're now doing support groups through, um, through this same device that we're using here today, we're doing support groups. And everybody that is engaged in any of our trainings are either uh, diagnosed or undiagnosed with a mental health disorder and are, are caregivers of someone with a mental health disorder. So we share some of the same stories. We hear each other for real, and we can share the stories about when I was there and how and what it is that I did that helped me get out of that rut. So it makes that whole family a little bit different, and particularly because we have uh, targeted some uh, under-resourced areas and underserved areas. It's really, uh, I think, uh, has been the probably the real power of my work in the last five, six years. One of the things we know is that males are much less likely to seek help. So how would you, how do you encourage that help? What kinds of things, you know, you hear that old adage, let them hit bottom first. I don't think you would recommend that. So what, what are the recommendations? One of the things that we have been able to do also with the mental health first aid training, we have uh, many churches have opened their door, churches and faith communities have opened their doors to allow us to bring the training in to, through, their, uh, through their churches. And usually that also just encompasses males as well. Angelina and I also have provided the mental health first aid training for all of the employees in Harris County Precinct 3, males and females. So those males as officers, as deputies, and in those uh, public service roles are now able to, to share that information with their family, with other people that are friends of yeah, theirs. And so that's one way to address that. Right now, there's a lot of online support groups. And so where um, uh, men may have more of an issue with walking into a group, especially when we know that most of our groups are well attended by women more so than men, um, it may seem less threatening to jump on a, a telephone support group or even a Zoom support group where the picture is not available, you know, because you don't have to share your picture. And uh, and listen in and listen to how other men are coping and and that's that's what I would recommend if you're if you're a, a male and you don't want to diminish your feeling of self by exposing your anonymity, then then join one of these online groups or phone in support groups. I know Nami has them, and all of the state organizations are offering online groups right now, and they're free. You know, hop into a group and 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 maintain that anonymity until you feel strong enough to really kind of ask questions and and move around that space and again like i said there's there's certain uh organizations that are very specific to individual diagnoses and sometimes being around people who are just like you can really do a lot to make you feel like you're not alone and i think those are the two ways that i would I would address that, but I'm also the mother of a son who he's he's macho macho man, and he is not, <laughs> you know. And so I tell him all the time he needs to get married, but uh, he says no, I've got you. And that's the that's what I that's what one of the things we share with people in mental health first aid. If if you can have one significant relationship where there's a lot of mutual respect and trust, right? And that person is willing to walk that distance of accountability, with you, then yes, you know, um, if that's your first level of help, go for it. Find someone that you trust 
that respects you that you can talk to and be transparent with. Um, it's just that sometimes you you like them to find somebody else, you know. But anyway, right now <laughs> I've got one hanging on. I got one hanging on real tight. <laughs> <laughs> all righty and on that we're going to end our webinar thank you all so much um, oh thank so, you thank you so helpful and um, all right we'll, we'll put it out there and thank you thank you thank you